Good morning. Uh, I'm Eleanor Tatum sitting in for Christine Nicholas. I would like to call the meeting to order. It is now 11.02. We're going to start by uh, taking attendance um, for all those calling in. I will start with the names um, from the RSVP list that I have here. Uh, Dan Fuller. I'm on. Catherine Good morning. Nichols. Good morning, Dan. Good morning. Catherine uh, Nichols. I'm here. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Ali Sirota. Mary Kay Verba. Here. Kristen Han Hanniflin. Jill Simpson Luciano. Jill, I'm um, sorry, Sarah McGinnis, Don Borchette, Samantha Hayes. Is there anyone I didn't call? I just joined Alexander Stanton. And Barbara Lee Diamondstein here has been on the call. Okay, thank Good you. Are they back? Uh, Warren Nelly. I'm sorry, can you repeat those? I heard. Alexander Stanton. Okay. Okay, we got those two, and there was another. Voice. I heard Tom Martinelli. <laughs> and Heather Backshaw. Yeah, Tom Martinelli. And then somebody else. Oh, hi, Heather. Heather Backshaw, and there was one more. Valerie Nablock. Good morning, Valerie. All right, thank you. For all those on the phone. It's Danae Jones. Hi, Danae. Yes. Denae Jones for is on. Hello. Hello. Randall Board right here. Hello. Introductions. Mark Dorr from the Tourism Association is on. Okay. Good morning, Mark. All right, for all of those on the phone, I want to note that we'll be placing you all on mute to eliminate any background noise. Uh, if you'd like to say something, please press star six to be unmuted. Uh, once you are finished, press pound six to place your line up once again on mute. Um, now we're going to go around the room, and uh, so I'm going to start to my right. Tom Mulroy. Heather McKelleny. Ralph Tregali, Port Authority. Randall Borscheid. Anna Packman. Uh, Imran Ansari, Discover Long Island. Rich Gagliano. Laura DeBetta, DEC. Sarah Emmert, Isle of New York. Kelly Garofalo Wilkins. Lisa Soto from Isle of New York. Marky Wilson, Isle of New York. Ross Levi, Isle of New York, too. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony Jahanbash, United Airlines. Ronnie White, Stroud, Unity. I'm Megadreamy. Eleanor Tatum, TAC. All right. Um, everyone should have received a copy of the minutes. Um, <coughs> and Kelly has additional ones if anyone needs a copy. Are there any changes, additions, corrections? Can we have a motion to approve the minutes? Tom? Uh, I'll make a motion. A second. We need a second from somebody. Uh, somebody on the phone. Can they hear? Tech tech member on the phone can. Uh, second. And who is that? Catherine, second. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Catherine. Okay. Second. All those in favor? Aye. All those in favor on the phone? Aye. 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 All right. The motion carries. Uh, and now I'm going to turn the meeting over to Ross. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eleanor, for pitching in. Uh, we appreciate you. you taking the reins. Uh, uh, Christine had a uh, funeral today, actually. It, was, um, it happens to be a somewhat tourism-related uh, funeral. It's uh, David Stern, uh, former commissioner of the NBA, um, who clearly not only did a lot for that league, uh, but actually did a lot for tourism here in New York mm -hmm. City, uh, and as a result, New York State as well. Um, and uh, Christine was asked to be at his, I'm not sure if it was the funeral memorial service, but in either case, that's where she is today. She sends her regrets. Um, but uh, we thank you, Eleanor, for pitching in. Um, so I'm going to be presenting uh, Christine's report this morning. So by saying, start by saying Happy New Year, everyone. Um, I wanted to mention that uh, Eric Gertler, uh, our new uh, commissioner and president and CEO here at Empire State Development, was actually hoping to join us today. Um, he, um, but uh, as you may have seen in the news, the governor is doing his budget presentation, and as you can imagine, the head of SED was called to Albany 
uh, to be there for that, uh, but he is hoping to be here at a future meeting. Um, so we'll, you'll all get to meet him very soon. Um, but we'll do our normal I Love New York report today. Um, and we also uh, have a guest speaker, Laura DeBetto, you heard, uh, from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, we'll be talking about the various uh, DEC programs um, that involve tourism. Um, we haven't had a guest speaker for a few meetings now, uh, but you'll be hearing our State of the State announcements very shortly of what the governor announced. And one of the things that became clear in that presentation is how many agencies are working on tourism now, which is a really great thing. We have a lot of sister agencies, a lot of colleagues uh, that are plugging away at tourism with us. Um, and so we thought it would be helpful for the tech to hear from one of those agencies who work very closely with DEC firsthand on what they are working on specifically in the area of outdoor recreation. So we look forward to that report. Um, so uh, a couple of, uh, first of all, member updates uh, for the TAC membership. Uh, at the end of the year, Spike Herzig submitted his letter of resignation from the TAC board. Uh, he was, uh, as a tourism professional and owner of his own travel company since 1966, Spike has been a great resource for the state's tourism industry and for TAC, and uh, we are very grateful for his contributions. And Christine wanted to thank him, and I'm sure all the TAC joins her in thanking him uh, for his service to New York State and New York State tourism. Uh, we have been in touch with the governor's appointments office uh, and efforts are ongoing to fill the vacant tax seats and we'll certainly uh, let you know news as we receive it. Um, the aforementioned state of the state uh, occurred on Wednesday, January 8th. Uh, I was there uh, in the audience uh, along with some other representatives of the tourism industry. Uh, Bob Provost, for example, from uh, New York State Tourism Industry Association was there. Um, as, in, as many of you know, this is uh, the time when the governor looks back uh, on his accomplishments of the past year and also looks forward outlines his 2020 agenda. Uh, included were a number of tourism proposals and uh, when uh, some of us, Sarah in particular, were looking over this and trying to figure out which ones to highlight, you realize that tourism is one of those things that everything touches tourism, right? If the economy is not going well, that's going to touch tourism. So just about everything. So there may be other things, uh, but we thought we'd highlight some that are most particularly uh, dealing with tourism. Um, so some of his announcements uh, included making New York State the top state for recreational fishing by investing in, our, in the state's world-class fisheries, uh, protecting high traffic public lands for future generations, I know we're going to hear about that, uh, by making more trails more durable for increased use, managing visitor traffic and hikers uh, to provide a more enjoyable and less congested user experience, uh, and launching education programs to enlist the public in protecting public lands. There was an announcement about investing in round 10 of the Regional Economic Development Councils and their funding, which you'll be hearing about later in the meeting. Um, as you probably know, those uh, empower communities and businesses in each region of the state to develop strategic plans tailored to their own unique economic development strengths. Um, there was an announcement around investing $100 million in round five of the Downtown Revitalization Initiative, uh, which works to strengthen downtown neighborhoods into vibrant, livable spaces that attract new residents and visitors. Uh, there was an announcement around investing $300 million into the Reimagine the Erie Canal Program. I think I may have mentioned this at prior TAC meetings. I, I uh, was a, a non-voting member of that group. Uh, the Reimagine Canal will serve as a destination that integrates the Empire State Trail and the Erie Canal into a new program to stimulate tourism and economic development. A first phase of funding will start this year uh, with a $100 million economic development fund to support projects that adaptively reuse canal infrastructure to enhance water recreation, tie the canal's new recreation improvements to the Governor's Erie, uh, Empire State Trail, and celebrate historic canal structures and develop unique canal sites, attractions, and activities. Expect to hear more about that in, in future weeks at future tax meeting at future tax meetings. The remaining 135 million of the plan's funding will subsequently be allocated to research uh, recommendations by the Reimagine <coughs> the Canals Task Force, as well as solutions related to flood mitigation, invasion, invasive species, and uh, ecosystem restoration. There was another announcement on growing New York State's world-class park system with new expanded and upgraded state parks. That initiative includes two whole new parks, the 508-acre state park in Kingston that will reimagine the formerly industrial Hudson River waterfront and a new Hudson River recreation area that will create the first linear 
water-based boat launches into the Hudson Eagles State Recreation Area. Uh, State Parks will continue to implement its capital plan by acquiring 4,000 acres of land in the Hudson Valley through a $20.6 million state investment, as well as renovating and reopening the pool at the FDR State Park in Westchester. There was another whole announcement about the uh, rebuilding the recently destroyed Mid-Station Lodge at Whiteface Mountain. You may have heard about the fire that happened over the holidays, um, but there was an announcement that that will be rebuilt. There was an announcement about uh, the MTA's capital plan to provide more reliable and accessible public transportation downstate with an additional $3 billion to be matched by New York City to fund the MTA's 2020, 2024 program that prioritizes the essential essential needs of the system, including the subway, LAR, Metro North, and bus service. There was an announcement around investing in a second round of funding for upstate airports. Uh, airports across the state will be encouraged to submit proposals to enhance safety and economic development, improve airport operations and access, reduce environmental impact, and create better passenger experiences, which obviously to us is a, a real key for tourism. Uh, there was an announcement around reimagining the Buffalo Skywalk and improving access to Buffalo's waterfront, an announcement <coughs> around developing an innovative strategy to build a high-speed rail, finally, in New York State, uh, and an announcement around ensuring cellular coverage across New York State, which you've heard at prior tech meetings is an issue uh, as far as tourism goes in areas like the Adirondacks. Toward the end of the address, the governor gave uh, kind of this really uh, fast-paced recap of all that has been done to strengthen New York State. And we were really excited to see how much of that work was related to tourism. Uh, and it's important to the state economy and the returns to the state that we're seeing from our investments in tourism. And it was really quite powerful, so we thought we'd show you a clip showing a section of that recap, not the whole thing. Largest expansion of upstate tourism, a new expo center at the State Fair, new stadium to keep the Mets in Syracuse, new Utica Nexus Center, historic modernization of the order facilities. We built the longest multi-use trail in the nation. We renovated Hotel Saranac, which is the premier destination in the North Country. Legoland coming to the Hudson Valley, 1,300 jobs. I love Legoland, yes kids. That is your next vacation. We're going to Legoland. <laughs> Get ready. Nation leading renewable energy program, lar largest artificial reef expansion in history. We started the Albany Skyway. We rebuilt Jones Beach for the first time since it was built. We have the nation's largest offshore wind project. We're rebuilding Roberto Clemente State Park. Largest land acquisition in the Adirondacks in 100 years, newest state park in Brooklyn, largest state park in New York City, the Shirley Chisholm Park, 400 acres, the Kosciuszko Bridge called Kosciuszko Bridge, I know. First new bridge in 50 years, South Bronx transformation at the Sheridan Expressway in Hunts Point, New Woodbury Transit Hub, cashless tolling all the New York City bridges and tunnels, and we're doing the entire throughway. New Islanders Arena, New Islanders Arena at Belmont, New Binghamton University Nursing School, New Utica Hospital, Rochester, Buffalo, Niagara Falls train stations, a new Long Island double track, Long Island third track. We rehabilitated the L train. They never even had to close the tunnel. We're rebuilding the Jacob Javits Center, expanding it by 50%, a new Moynihan train hall that is going to be stunning and knock your socks off, a new Syracuse airport, new Plattsburgh airport, new Amira Corning airport, new Rochester airport, new Ithaca airport, new Albany airport, new Stewart International airport, new JFK airport, new LaGuardia airport. So, like I said, that was just one section. <laughs> it was sort of literally breathless. Um, and uh, I think one of the most important things it showed for me uh, was how the governor has and continues to make tourism a high priority in his economic development agenda. Um, you know, to take that much time and really uh, show the pride he's had in those accomplishments speaks well uh, of our work and his commitment to tourism. So, we are excited to see all that. Um, 
largest. Yes. We got it. We got it. <laughs> <laughs> Did anybody happen to see, by the way, CBS Sunday Morning? I think it was this week where they were talking about America's uh, rebuilding the airports. And uh, there was an interview with the governor and a walkthrough yes. of, uh, of JFK Airport. It was, again, or LaGuardia, rather. Yeah. And again, it was emphasizing the same points that, uh, you know, building for tourism is vitally important. So, any questions on the state of the state? Great. If not, we will transition immediately into the uh, I Love New York report. Um, I wanted to start by letting you know about a few uh, new team members we've had join us since our last meeting. Um, they are all up in Albany. Uh, one is uh, Jessica David. She is the manager of tourism programs and operations. Um, and she'll be reporting to Heather, who's here with us today. Uh, she's worked in a variety of roles for the downtown Albany bid, the New York State Assembly, and most recently uh, in the governor's office in the executive chamber. Uh, in her role, she will be supporting Heather in our industry relations work, uh, working on tourism programs like Path Through History, as well as uh, our sort of back of house tourism operations like the I Love New York Call Center. Uh, we have another new team member, Alyssa Fox. She is an economic development program specialist. She comes to us from SUNY System Administration, where she supported the assistant vice chancellor with various projects, budgeting, and special events. Uh, in her role with us, Alyssa will be supporting the tourism grants team, uh, particularly Kelly Beccarizzo, uh, for the tourism promotion matching funds program, including the day-to-day -day approvals and program support for matching funds to our tourism partners in the counties. Uh, and then Natasha Polsonello uh, is an administrative assistant, comes to us from the Office of Addiction Services and Supports, uh, one of our sister agencies in New York State. Uh, in her role as an administrative assistant, Natasha will be uh, kind of our billing guru, facilitate all our billing, which is really important, our invoices, our payment processes, as well as assisting with daily office procedures and needs. I am happy to say with those three additions, the New York State Division of Tourism is fully staffed for the first time since I've been executive director. So we are thrilled to have a fully staffed team. I know all that means is there's going to be a transition coming, but um, no, uh, we're very excited. We had some really talented, we have a, a whole talented team. These new folks are really a, a great group of talented individuals. And so we're uh, hopeful and expecting that we'll do more than ever before. So stay tuned. Uh, and we thank them and welcome them on board. Um, so we are uh, around the time of year, obviously, where we're promoting winter um, and thought we would take a few minutes to talk specifically about winter advertising. And well, there could be no better person to do that than uh, you had to meet him at our last meeting, our new Senior Vice President of Marketing, uh, Rich Gagliano. So, um, so yeah, like Ross said, we are proud to share, right time of year, our uh, most recent winter spots. Um, we started running around the holidays, so I don't know if you've maybe you've seen these already. Um, you know, our typical media strategy where these run within a, you know, like a, um, what is it, about five hour driving radius is our, is our typical, you know, as far as our reach goes, in state and out of state. We adjust the plan as the, you know, we monitor the plan kind of just as needed. But these are running, um, there'll be edited versions you'll be seeing on social media. There's also a digital plan that supports this. Um, as you'll see, well, you know, we'll play it first and we can, Like I said, that's our main spot that's running on air. There'll be edited versions on digital and social, and it follows our, our strategy of having a good mix of indoor and outdoor attractions, um, and try to cover as many regions as possible. Obviously, in a 30-second you know, spot, there's only so much we can cover. Um, but we go into deeper detail on the website, and it's part of the social campaigns with this. Um, I don't know if there's any questions. Has anyone seen it on air? We, were on, we had a couple, couple good placements during the football playoffs a couple weeks ago. Um, or on cable, um, but yeah, it's up there running. It usually takes, when we first start, it takes a couple days to fully ramp up, but it's been running since the holidays, so it should be up in you know, full, full weight right now. And again, this runs pretty much uninterrupted until sometime in March. Great. No way to get that on the Super Bowl 
half time, huh? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> waiting, for, waiting for a sale. <laughs> well, we welcome donations. Okay. I think the state <laughs> can take donations. Best right. donations. <laughs> yeah, we do. I mean, actually, there are, you know, there are affordable ways of getting near the Super Bowl. You know, there's a lot of tricks you can play where you can run right before kickoff, during a local buy, so when someone sees your spot, it's like, wow, you bought a national $5 million spot. Well, no, it was only bought in New York, and it was technically a cable spot, and it was pre-kickoff, but it's still, you know, you get I, you think I, I think I may have seen local, at least mm -hmm. upstate, uh, in prior years. So Possibly, yeah, possibly. And so that's our latest spot. Um, I would like to take full credit for it, but obviously the team worked on it, and I, I started when this was about to launch, so I was not involved in any of the shooting or the creative development of this. But um, again, it's up, we're running, happy it's out there. And then anyone has any questions, Sorry. feel free to let us know right now or reach out. Great. Thank you, Rich. Uh, speaking of digital uh, and social, uh, we've had a, a, a great campaign, uh, which Anna is happy to tell us about. Sure, and actually before I do, I have a new staffing announcement of my own to share. So we are very excited to welcome Danielle Lee as our new digital editorial coordinator, working with our editorial team on the content that you see on ilovenear.com. She'll also be working um, very closely on that, with us on the app. Um, she's a recent college grad, um, just graduated in May 2019 from Ithaca College, so go upstate. Uh, she's originally from Florida, but we think we fully converted her. So um, before coming here, she did internships at publications like Paper Magazine. She also did a social media internship at UNICEF, and we're very excited to have her on board. And hopefully by the time of our next tech meeting, I'll be able to say that we're fully staffed in digital marketing as well. Um, but on to the campaign. So this past December, we ran a campaign called Build Your Own Bucket List. Um, and really, you know, the idea from this came from a successful content series that we have that you might have seen on the website. Every season and every year, we release a bucket list, which is basically I Love New York's recommendations for must-sees. Um, and we, you know, include all the regions. We rotate through a variety of activities. And this year, we decided to make it interactive. So. When we put up our 2020 bucket list, we made it an interactive page, which you kind of see in the graphic on the right there, where users could go and they could identify three places that they would add to their personal bucket list. That's why it's called build your own bucket list because you can actually build your own bucket list on this page. And by adding um, these attractions to your personal bucket list, what you would do is be entered in a sweepstakes where you could win a trip to New York State to actually go and experience this, um, thanks to our partners over at JetBlue and our TPAs who donated prizes. Um, and to really up the engagement, we allowed people to get extra entries for sharing the fact that they entered um, the sweepstakes on social media. So if they shared on Facebook or Twitter, or if they followed us on Instagram, um, we gave them an extra entry. And then we sent these personal bucket lists to them in a personalized email um, to allow them to explore more deeply. Um, it was incredibly successful. It was number one page on our whole website for the duration of the campaign. And 94% of the people that we surveyed, so people who participated in the sweepstakes, said that they got new ideas about things to do and places to go in New York State. And most importantly, 76% said they're likely or extremely likely to plan a New York State getaway as a result of their participation. Great. Thank you. Any questions? Is it do, are any or ski resorts? I know we have the most ski mountains in the country by we numbers. Know, ski, um, ski areas. Ski yes. areas. Um, we obviously have Whiteface, which hosted two Olympics. Which yep. is nice, which, you know, I think we should somehow pop that out there that it's the only place in the country to host two Olympics. Um, also, are any of our mountains or uh, resorts anywhere in the top ten in the country or not? I don't know. Not there are any. I don't know. I can have, we'll ask the association. Top 20, yeah, we, we, you know, certain highlights that we should pop. You know, growing up in the area, you know, Vermont is obviously a main competitor, and they've, they've, I think, beat the hell out of New York in skiing. For some reason, they're further away. They have ski on, ski off, nicer hotels, resorts. Um, I don't think we're going to compete with people that want to fly to Aspen or whatever out west, but how can we put the wow factor there? We have more than anyone else, you know, competing against Vermont. We have higher ranked ones if we do compared to Vermont. We have to steal those Vermont people somehow. Yeah. And that's including Connecticut, because most of Connecticut's going to Vermont. 
Why? They have better facilities. They have better hotels. How do we address that? And if we have anything to compete currently or to stimulate better competition with better natural resources, how do we do that and get that? Yeah, out? the strategy with the ski industry has been first and foremost to emphasize the convenience more than anything else. The idea that wherever, whatever city you are in New York State, if you're visiting from another place, you're within 30 minutes of skiing. Um, and for, particularly for New York City, uh, more and more they've been looking at that too, the idea of you are just minutes away from great skiing in the Catskills and that kind of thing. So I know that has been mainly their strategy. Um, and, we, and we have been emphasizing, as you can see, um, just the idea of there is great skiing here, you don't have to go very far, you don't have to spend very much, um, but there's terrific skiing here. That so far has been kind of the strategy and approach. Yeah, I mean, it, it just seems like, just big picture, you, you think of New York skiing, it seems like it's old, it's antiquated compared to the new modern facilities in even our backyard, Vermont. You know, again, different world out in Colorado and in the West, but how do we emphasize what we currently have better, if we do have anything better, and how can we stimulate existing resorts to upgrade to better, say, in a partnership, and get more people to be aware of the wow factor again? I picked Whiteface because it is host the two Olympics. You got the Olympic up there, but even closer within two hours, we sell because this is just a blanket sell, which is great. But where's the wow factor? You know, well, I mean, Powder Magazine is consistently rated like Bel Air and mm -hmm. Hunter and Wyndham, like Great Family Mountains, and but are they top ten? Are they top twenty? How do they um, compare to Vermont, well, I mean, or is it just within this range? Well, within like the. Get, you know, they're all different categories that they put them into. So, like within you know four hours from New York City, things like that. Well, Vermont is probably within four hours, right? Well, it depends which mountains you're looking at. Yeah, the southern ones. Right. But I mean, is, where, where is the where we can say that you know here's a state of the art facility, hotels or or, or um, anything to compete? You know, we're, we're starting to develop a strategy around that. You know, in, in 2023. Whiteface is hosting, or the Ari is hosting the, the what's it called, the Winter the University, University Games. University yeah. Games, which is similar to the Winter Olympics. It's a tier down, it's like um, the best of the university athletes. So we're trying to build awareness of the whole Adirondack region as an area of, like you said, it's hosting two Olympics. It's got, it's not just good for New York, it's world class, and not just skiing, but in summer with the rapids and all the other sort of extreme sports you can do there. Um, so we're working on a strategy to help get the word out about that to kind of help build up the area as a world-class destination for those types of attractions, you know, leading up to the World Games, which is in three years from now. So we're starting to develop something like that. And we actually had a conversation last week about how do we join forces from what we're doing at a high level to what the individual resorts are doing and regions are doing at a local level to help amplify those messages. So we're going to be working tighter with those regions, with those, you know, resorts and attractions, have them understand what we're doing at a high level, what they're doing at a micro level, and how can we both work better to amplify those messages? And whatever those specific messages are, how to work more hand in hand to help develop those. To, to I, I think the biggest push is really going to be facilities, you know, because you know, Whiteface is great. I mean, we were very involved in doing the Whiteface Lodge at one point. The problem is, you know, people that are going to go there are tired of taking a school bus to Whiteface Mountain and going to a 1950s facility. Right. You know, how can we stimulate that? And, you know, because you walk around with kids with skis and you got to go in a car or a bus. It's, it's just, you, know, you can't compete. I mean, we're Vermont, forget about it again out west for now, but in the region here, it's, it's perceived it's very cumbersome to take kids skiing up here. You got to walk around, there's really very little ski on, ski off of quality. White face is none. You have to drive there and they just lug your skis in, lug your skis up. It's just a nightmare. Well, you can literally go to Vermont and they literally take your skis and put them right on the mountain for you or your place is right on the mountain and you, and you go off. So we can advertise all we want, but we need those types of wow factors where people are like, well, I'm, I don't need this aggravation. I'm going to drive four and a half hours to Whiteface or whatever, and I go to Vermont. It's a lot easier. and It's like the 1950s. So that's some of the things, you know, we have to think about because January through March is dead. You know, that's our slow season anywhere north of Manhattan. Um, you know, people don't even think in general outside this area, if, unless you have to drive within an hour or two or three hours. Um, it's, it's mostly Vermont. Uh, Connecticut, I don't know anyone in Connecticut that goes skiing in New York. They're all Vermont. We can easily capture that market. We're closer. We should have better facilities. So that's something to think about as you know, as partnerships with these resorts or whatever. That's always been an issue is hospitality and, and quality of service. So. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um,
We now want to talk about a new international campaign uh, that has launched, uh, focusing on the UK. It's called New York City Plus, uh, and Mark Lee can update you on that. Yeah, it's a an appetizer that's been presented to the industry in the UK. Uh, the big meal has been there for a long time. There is the package called uh, Wine, Water and Wonders. That's really old. There's a new one called Beyond the Big Apple, which combines the city and various places in the state. But those are long vacations. What's new about this appetizer, NYC Plus, is that it is a short trip with about two nights in the city and about two nights in upstate New York. So it's targeting those who have never tried it. It's a way of making it easier for the operators in the UK to introduce the idea of a taste of upstate New York uh, to, to their customers. And the fact that it is NYC Plus has encouraged NYC and company to get on board and support us in promoting this. So there's a new way now of presenting the idea of trying upstate New York uh, to the British uh, travelers. And so that has launched already, uh, just launched last week. And uh, so we're excited about the opportunity for uh, new, new travelers to take that first step outside of New York City. Any questions on that? Great. Um, so uh, a number of industry events uh, that I want to let folks know about. Um, I'm fairly recently back from the American Bus Association Annual Marketplace, uh, which as the name implies, is the motor coaches industry's uh, biggest domestic trade show. Uh, and uh, a lot of our local partners from around the state have been going to that for years and doing sales meeting with the various motor coach operators. Uh, and I Love New York has been involved uh, only in the last couple of years as a sponsor uh, working with the industry to make sure that New York State has a strong presence. It was held uh, January 11th through 14th in Omaha, um, and as one can expect uh, when traveling through Midway, uh, uh, Chicago, uh, it was a 24-hour journey for me to get from here to there, but we got there, and once I got there, it was actually pretty great. Uh, I Love New York and the New York State uh, DMO Association hosted a breakfast for all the tour operators tour operators, there are over 300 of them attending the show. Um, and that gave us the opportunity to give them an overview of recent uh, and upcoming developments across New York State's 11 vacation regions, uh, obviously emphasizing those things that are of interest to the uh, motor coach market. Um, we also provided entertainment. Uh, the National Center, uh, the National Comedy Center provided a stand-up comedian who did a routine. It was actually tailored. A lot of it was tailored to the bus industry. They loved it. Um, and then we had a booth on the floor. Uh, and uh, that, you know, so we could have meetings with tour operators. And that evening uh, had a dine around, which was kind of an evening reception where the tour operators can have more one on one time to meet with us. Uh, this is our second year of having that breakfast. Uh, and it is now getting to be an event that people are sort of looking forward to every year. And we've had entertainment last year was music. This is the first year we had comedy. Um, and obviously, the reason you do it is you get this captive audience, people uh, who are in front of you, and you have that time to really have their attention and highlight the state. This continues to be an important market for a lot of our partners in New York State. It's really important for Niagara Falls and Corning Museum and the Baseball Hall of Fame. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a good show for us to have a presence at. Uh, I also attended a meeting of the New York State Tourism Industry Association's uh, strategic planning. Uh, it was a strategic planning meeting they held on December 4th at the TWA Hotel uh, out at uh, the airport here in New York City. Um, it was a meeting with sort of board and key stakeholders to take a look at that organization. You got to meet Bob Provost, uh, their chair, uh, their uh, president, I think is his title. Uh, he came to a meeting not too long ago, um, and he's about a year into the job now. So it's a good time to take a look at what that organization is doing and how it can uh, best serve its members and the industry. Uh, one of the outcomes is they're going to have specific board committees uh, to discuss and develop strategies around advocacy, membership, collaboration and marketing, and education and professional development. So it was a, a great discussion and a great day-long retreat, basically, um, to help define that very important trade group to New York State and what they'll be doing going forward. 
We have uh, another important activation coming up this weekend, uh, at the Javits Center. It's a New York Times travel show week. Um, and Danae Jones uh, Parsip, whom most of you know up in Albany, uh, is our key coordinator of that. And Danae's on the phone, can give you a quick sneak preview on that. Are you there, Danae? Is it on mute? We may have to unmute the phone. Hold on. Oh, up oh, there you are. You're good. Can you hear? Yes. Yep, we can hear oh, you now. Great. You guys. Oh, lovely. Thank you so much. Hold on just one moment. You guys started very quickly. Uh, <laughs> the New York Times. <laughs> The New York Times Travel Show is this weekend from January 24th through the 26th. Friday is our trade day, which is just open to tour operators, media, um, if there's no consumers on this first day. And it's a great opportunity for us and our partners to kind of meet one-on-one um, -on -one with the industry. And then Saturdays and Sundays are our consumer days where we get to talk about all of the amazing things uh, that New York State has to offer and help people uh, want to plan their vacations and stay right in New York instead of going to any of those other places. Um, so yeah, so we're really excited about that. We, once again, this is our second year as coming on as a bronze sponsor, which really gives us the opportunity to have all of our partners in one consecutive row. Um, there's been years where we've kind of been like half in one aisle and then a little over on the other side and we would try to find wayfinding and a way to keep everybody unified but we discovered that by doing a sponsorship it allowed us to secure enough booths so that all of our partners across the state can come and exhibit together and it just creates such a unified presence um, and we are kicking Florida spot. Um, so this sponsorship <laughs> includes logo in inclusion on the seminar stage, um, registration, directional signage, the show bags, um, there's our logos on the website, we have some banner ads on the website, we also received some ad space in the New York Times Magazine, uh, quarter page co-branded ad in the New York Times newspaper. Um, the banner and the logo placement on the show website. On Friday, Ross Levi is going to be conducting interviews with a number of travel journalists that our PR company is setting up. So that's once again another great opportunity for us to present what we offer here at New York State. And then this year, we are sponsoring the LGBT Travel Pavilion, and we are going to do a really unique kind of activation on Saturday, which is a quiz show hosted by Ross called You Think You Know New York. So it's going to have prizes and it's a fun, engaging way to let LGBT travelers know about all that awaits them on an amazing New York State get getaway. Thank you, Danae. That's everything. I know you've worked. Very welcome. I know you've been working very hard on that, along with our other, a lot of our other team members, our experiential team, and so uh, it's a really important opportunity for us. You can see, you know, when you have 18 or 19 partners up there, you know, and now we have an aisle. Um, that's only been true for a few years now, and so we've really evolved in terms of our presence at this very important uh, show. It's really kind of our core audience to talk to New York City folks and about. Um, to Tom's point about getting out in the state and seeing all that the state has to offer them. The Ski Association will be there as well. Um, so hopefully we'll be getting the message out about the skiing as well. Any questions on New York Times, American Bus Association, any of the activations I talked about? Okay. Um, the last piece of my report uh, that I wanted to talk about was uh, uh, the Market New York funding um, because those uh, awards were just made uh, recently, since our last meeting. Uh, most of you know the Regional Economic Development <laughs> Councils were established in uh, 2011 by Governor Cuomo um, as a new mechanism of doing economic development in the state moving more on a bottom-up approach than a top-down. Um, to set up these Regional Economic Development Councils, the REDCs, uh, in every region of New York State, 
um, and have groups of business leaders and academics and elected officials um, getting together and forming the economic development strategy for their regions. Um, many of those have tourism subcommittees or at least members of the tourism industry on their REDCs, um, so tourism is an important part of what they do. Um, certainly one of the most important things they do is give away a lot of money, um, hundreds of millions of dollars every year. Um, that's given. That's done through the Consolidated Funding Application, the CFA. It's one online application to apply for these multiple streams of state economic development monies, which again is a new, uh, more efficient process both for the state and more importantly for the users. Instead of having to do eight applications with a bunch of different agencies, you get to do this one application and it applies to the whole program. Um, so this year's uh, awards, the REDC awards, were announced on December 19th uh, and collectively gave away $761 million in state resources. Um, and Market New York, which is our piece, the, the, the specific tourism piece, um, is one of 30 available grant programs. Uh, it was started specifically to strengthen tourism and attract visitors to the state through the promotion of destinations, attractions, and special events. Um, and the, the, it has evolved now that it is available. The name is a bit of a misnomer because it's not just marketing. That's one piece of it is a marketing program. The other piece is for special events, and the other piece is for capital programs, tourism capital programs. Um, Rose, yes. One uh, quick question. Um, of the money that gets given away every year in the CFA process, yep. about $750 million a year gets awarded. Do we have a history? It's been around six years or seven years that program has been around. It's a great program. Yep. But how much has actually been claimed and used and funded of that over the last five, six, seven years? Since Most, I mean, as far as I know, I can really only speak to Market New York. And every year there's a few grants that either go down a little or one or two that don't get utilized out of the 60, but the vast majority of it, 90 percent of it goes out the door. How much um, of that is of the 750? How much is the New York piece of it? Uh, ours is 15 million. Okay. But of the 750, though, they, we should be able to figure out how much of that in the last five. So since it started, the governor put that in years ago. And again, it's a great program. Yeah. I'd just be interested to know how much of it was actually funded over the last five years of the various grants over those years. Yes. Yeah, I'll check. Like I said, I doubt I doubt it goes down a lot because there's not, I mean, well, folks. No, I mean, it, it's granted at 750 every year. Yeah. So that's awarded. But the actual projects that yeah, no, the, the money that goes out the door. Actually, yeah, yeah. I mean, but the way the way the process works is when you put in, which you probably know. I mean, when you put in your application, you have to put what you're going to spend on. Right. And like I said, there are occasionally I know there are projects that never come to fruition. Right. But I I can't say that's more. I can't believe that's more than like ten percent over that time. So I would guess it's ten percent. Interesting to that. know that number. Though, yeah. just for the okay. The we can find out. I mean, like I said, I know for. Market New York, we've had 83 million go out the door right. for 200 projects since the program since inception. The yeah, okay. and like I said, that's that's the part we're responsible for. But I can probably sure. find out about the sure. the overall. Um, and so um, yeah, when this program started for us for Market New York, it was only three million dollars. So the fact that it's grown to 15 uh, is a is a very big deal. Um, yeah, because actually to your question, Tom, when I'm I'm checking two numbers, the awarded amount in the history of Market New York has been 95.5. The amount that's gone out the door is 83. So that's what I expect. It's kind of about a 10% drop off or something. Yeah, I mean, New York, it seems very, very good. But yeah. I'm not sure how that works with the rest of the state. It'd be interesting yeah. to know just for identification. Yeah. So there's okay. a way to fine tune it that it can be used. Once it's granted, we should want to make sure those projects actually come to fruition. Mm -hmm. Yep. I'll check. Um, and so the $15 million that was awarded this past December for the most current round uh, went to 60 tourism projects throughout the state. Um, there was close to 180 applications for those 60 awards. So that's a very competitive program. That's good news for us. It tells us that people are interested in the program, and it tells us that we have a good bunch to pick from so that we're, we're actually getting projects that are going to have a, a good impact. Um, it broke down to $7 million for marketing projects um, and $8 million for capital. Um, so there were 40 marketing programs and 20 capital programs. Um, just a couple of examples so you have a, a sense of the sort of things that have been funded. Uh, the Albany Symphony Orchestra is going to be highlighting the new Empire State Trail with a special musical event, the American Music Festival Trail. Um, that'll be in the capital region. Um, in commemoration of the 100th anniversary of women getting the right to vote and the passage of the Constitutional Amendment, the Finger Lakes region has been granted two awards uh, for the National 
Susan B. Anthony Museum House to initiate a special event and to undertake a tourism capital project. Uh, the New York Marine Resource, I'm sorry, the New York Marine Rescue Center, uh, which is located in Long Island, will implement an ecotourism program uh, called Tourism's Role in Saving Endangered Sea Life. So it's both uh, an ecotourism, an eco, uh, an economic, an ecologically friendly program, but also one to uh, involve visitors in that project. And the Adirondack Historical Association, located in the North Country, is introducing a new diversity initiative marketing program that will explore African American and Latino perceptions of the Adirondacks and the interest in visiting there to help inform uh, their marketing, training, and, and other things in the Adirondacks. So that's just a highlight, like I said, that's four of 60. Um, a full list is available if you're interested on the uh, Governor's Regional Council website, which is regionalcouncils.ny.gov. Um, and, uh, and like we said, it's important to recognize that um, you know, this is only a small part of the REDCs that go towards tourism. Our 15 million is a small chunk, but there are all kinds of other projects that are being funded through the greater REDC um, that are about tourism or have a direct impact. For example, a lot of the hotel development projects that have come through the REDCs through the year haven't been through Market New York. They've been through the broader REDC. So, um, you know, we're, we're excited for that program and, and its ability to get resources to New York State tourism. Any further questions on the REDCs? If not, uh, at this point, uh, I am happy to introduce our guest speaker. Um, Laura DiBetto is Director of Outdoor Recreation at the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. She oversees the agency's Adventure New York initiative, which was launched by the governor in 2017. Prior to joining DEC, Laura spent nearly 20 years working for state and national nonprofit organizations on environmental issues, program development, and communications. And we're thrilled uh, for the TAC to hear about all the important and exciting things happening uh, at the, our partner agency at the DEC. Thank you, Ross. Um, thank you all so much for the opportunity to share some of the things that we're doing at DEC. Um, it may not be the first thing you think of when you think of the Department of Environmental Conservation, but believe it or not, there are a lot of ways in which our agencies interact and, um, you know, there's a, a strong role for our agency to play in promoting um, tourism and, and, in particular, the outdoors. So kind of along those lines, um, again, when you think of DEC, you might mostly think about um, air and water and permits, solid waste, uh, things like that. But what you may not know is that we are actually the largest landholder in New York State, public or private. Uh, we manage nearly 5 million acres of land, and most of that is open to the public to enjoy for recreation. Um, as you can see, most of it is in the Adirondacks. Uh, second largest area is in the Catskills, but we have state forests, wildlife management areas, and other land facilities all across um, New York State. And um, all of those lands, as you can imagine, include quite a bit of recreational infrastructure from thousands of miles of trails to boat launches, campgrounds, education centers, fish hatcheries, fire towers, our new favorite uh, asset. Um, and all of those, just real quick, um, provide endless opportunities for the public to, to enjoy the outdoors and, and in most cases at a very affordable, you know, if not free uh, uh, way um, and really give people the opportunity to connect with nature, connect with the outdoors all across New York State. Uh, we estimate that we accommodate 75 million visitors each year between hikers, paddlers, hunters, anglers, Visitors to our campgrounds, our education centers, we have youth camps, and again, fish hatcheries. So quite a lot of people utilizing uh, those five million acres of land. And of course, I don't need to tell you, but the outdoor recreation economy is pretty important to New York State, providing a you know, significant number of jobs and, and economic uh, output and inputs to, to New York State. And, and I would say that DEC, and including and, and in particular our commissioner, really understand that in many cases our lands are sort of the gateway to large recreation areas. Our lands are the reason 
that people are coming to certain areas, places like Lake Placid um, or the Catskills. And, and so we feel that um, you know, it's an important for us to make sure that those lands and facilities are an asset to the communities in which they're located so that we can you know, you know, support those local economies. Obviously, have, having 5 million acres of land and 75 million visitors means you're, there are going to be some challenges as land managers. Uh, so we have aging infrastructure. Um, some of our facilities um, you know, need upgrading. Our campgrounds, a couple of them are celebrating their 100th anniversary this year. So we have comfort stations that don't look maybe as comforting as modern visitors are expecting. We have uh, aging sewer and water systems. We have trails, as, as Ross kind of mentioned earlier, trails. We have trails that were built 100 years ago straight up a mountain, not using modern, sustainable trail design. Um, we have, uh, obviously, as many of you probably are aware, some areas are experiencing unprecedented levels of use. And with that use comes with it challenges with public safety, um, challenges to protecting the natural resources that are the reason people are coming to visit those lands and just challenges to preserving the visitor experience that people are looking for. Um, and then there are these broader societal changes that we as land managers have to be thinking about. Our, you know, New Yorkers are much more urban. Um, many more people living in urban areas, so even though we have more people visiting out the, the outdoors, there might be a little bit of a disconnect. Maybe they're not as experienced in recreation, and so we have a lot of unprepared visitors. We have an aging population. We have a diverse population. So what, how do we make sure that our lands and our resources are relevant to people of all backgrounds, all ages and all abilities? What are their expectations, and how can we make sure that we're, we're still providing people with a positive experience when they're visiting our lands? So recognizing all these things, the, the infrastructure needs, the, the visitors, the challenges we're facing, um, the governor in 2017, as Ross mentioned, launched a new initiative aimed at improving access to DEC lands and resources and improving the user experience. And that initiative is Adventure New York. Um, I came on board actually the same time, three years ago, really sort of signaling a, a commitment from DEC to looking at outdoor recreation as a really core to our mission as, at the agency. Um, the governor also announced several new programs in that state of the state. I was I am still busy, but I was very, very busy when I came on board figuring out, okay, this is really exciting. This is a significant commitment to the outdoors, to access. Now we've got to hit the ground running, implementing all these new programs, which I'll mention in a minute. So when I talk about Adventure New York, they're sort of the, the what we're doing, and these are the four strategic priorities that we're trying to implement. We're trying to improve and enhance access to the outdoors, connect people with nature, protect the natural resources they're coming to see, and also boost local economies. But I think the, the more um, practical thing to talk about is sort of how we're implementing Adventure New York. And the how falls into three buckets. We're making physical improvements to our lands and our facilities to provide more access and improve the user experience. We're um, launching inclusive programs aimed at connecting people to those resources, and then we're enhancing our marketing and promotions, which is obviously pretty important so, so people know what you actually have to offer. So infrastructure improvements is a key part of Adventure New York. That first budget announcement uh, tied to Adventure New York included a $50 million investment in recreational infrastructure and DEC, um, really a, a significant commitment to our agency to trying to bring our facilities up to modern expectations and standards. So across this, oh, there's a big gap there. Oh, oh well. <laughs> well, that's sad because there's there, we fixed that that bathhouse and it's now much more appealing and comforting. But it got lost in translation. That's okay. So we're modernizing and rehabilitating our comfort stations and campgrounds, so you don't see restrooms like that anymore. I promise. There's a nice shiny one um, <laughs> that's there now. We're we're building new and expanded. Um, trails and trail networks, for example, 20 plus miles of mountain bike trails in, um, oh, oh, well, that was fancier than I intended it to be. <laughs> Sorry about that. Ah, there you go. Much, much better. 
um, where building, you know, m more modern amenities, um, such as at North South Lake Campground, which is our fla a flagship campground in the Catskills, things like, you know, paddle boards and a beach house and new beach access. So across the state, really making these improvements. Uh, and with everything, accessibility is a priority. Uh, certainly, it's not possible for us, just given the nature of some of our lands and where they are and the rules that predate any of us to how they're managed. We, we can't make all of our lands, uh, you know, meet accessibility standards, but when we can, it's definitely a priority. And we're creating places that are really accessible destinations like Basswood Pond State Forest outside of Cooperstown, Billy Wildlife Marsh outside of Johnstown and Gloversville. Um, so really making sure that people of all ages and abilities can access our facilities. Um, we're also creating places that can serve as recreation hubs and gateways to, to, to certain areas. For example, um, the redevelopment of the former Frontier Town theme park in exit, uh, off exit 29 in North Hudson in the Adirondacks, another partnership with ESD, we're working on that project, uh, and the Catskills Visitor Center. You know, these places are envisioned as destinations in and of themselves, but then also places where you can, you know, sort of serve as your base camp and then go explore different areas and hopefully learn more about um, how to recreate safely, sustainably, where might be an appropriate experience for you given your skill level and things like that. That's really important to, that's an important strategy related to how we're managing these high levels of use in certain areas. Uh, so the second bucket is inclusive programming. I mean, it's great to build all these new amenities and facilities, but you have to give people an opportunity to use them. Um, otherwise, you know, they're not, they might not feel that, um, be so inspired on their own. So the emphasis is on guided introductory quality experiences so that we're giving people you know, these really positive experiences so that they want to then continue to participate in these activities on their own. Um, we're working to try to reduce some of the barriers to participating in the outdoors, things like cost, uh, geography and transportation. So we try to host our events as close to population centers as possible. Not always easy with DEC lands. We've got some pretty far afield uh, lands, but we try to have people sort of start someplace close to home so that then they can feel comfortable going further out. Um, and sometimes awareness is the biggest barrier. They just don't know that these lands are out there and that they're for the public. And all these programs are an opportunity, again, to educate people right from the beginning Here's how you recreate safely, sustainably, and responsibly um, so you have safe, fun adventures. Uh, in the interest of time, I will not, I won't go into the details of sort of these three programs that were announced by the governor, but he, he announced three in the state of the state in 2017, a first time camper program, I Bird New York, and Outdoors Day. And again, all of these are aimed at beginners, um, meant to be welcoming and inclusive, we're sort of, I like to say, we're demystifying the outdoors for people. I know I grew up in Queens and the out, you know, the wilderness is a scary place for some people. So we're, we're just giving people information on what to expect, how to be prepared, uh, guide them through the process. And in all of them, there is also this element of tourism um, because we are encouraging people to go farther afield, giving them ideas for places to go and things to do beyond just DECs that facility. Um, and these programs have been really, really successful, very positive, especially the, the first time camper program, I would say it's, it's really transforming lives for people who have, you know, never slept outside of a high rise in New York City before. Um, so I encourage you to look into those programs a little bit more because we're, we're really excited about them. Um, so I do want to spend a little bit of time on uh, another a couple of programs and a summer tourism campaign that you, I mean, Ross, you may have talked about it at previous TAC meetings, but over the summer, the governor announced uh, a program called See the Catskills Like Never Before, which was really aimed at promoting specifically hiking uh, in the Catskills. And this was a great joint effort between DEC and ESD and um, two new programs were launched, one more aimed at beginners and one aimed at uh, more advanced hikers. So the first is Hike With Us Catskills, which is, again, that guided, introductory, family-friendly, more beginner programming. The second was the Catskills Fire Tower 5 Challenge. Um, and you can go ahead and click. So both were really 
well received by the public and turned out to be great ways to introduce people to these activities, but again, also encourage them to check out communities and restaurants and shops. So we worked with I Love New York. Well, I say we worked. I Love New York, Lisa. Uh, thank you. You know, created itineraries around the fire towers, around the hike, so that people um, would be encouraged to you know, have ideas about what else they could do while they did this. And again, it was really successful in doing that. Um, you know, we have some great stories like this family by the fire tower from Fort Drum. They spent their whole vacation camping at one of our campgrounds, hiking the five fire towers. They, that's what they made as their, their family vacation. Um, and because some people have to make a challenge out of a challenge, we had lots of people do all five in one day. This woman did all five in less than 12 hours. Wow. <laughs> I don't recommend this if you are new to hiking. Um, but really, people, the, the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive. People love the Fire Tower Challenge. Um, I think it's okay for me to say we had nearly 900 people complete the Fire Tower Challenge. Very, very positive, very, very well received. So stay tuned for 2020. So last, and obviously I'm speaking to the experts on marketing and communications, but for, for an agency like DEC, this is, this is sort of newer territory for us. Um, but since launching Adventure New York, we've placed an emphasis on improving and, and, and being more strategic and, and proactive in getting the word out about our programs, about our improvements. So obviously events, uh, you know, ribbon cuttings, you can go ahead. Um, pretty standard, obvious, but we didn't always do them as frequently as we do now, which is take the time to make sure that we celebrate and announce improvements. And they have really, these events can really help highlight these resources and, and help get the word out to the public that these things are out there available for them to use. So we're doing a lot more of those. Obviously, digital communications is super critical today. Um, and we've placed a lot of emphasis on trying to be, you know, a little bit less like a regulatory agency and more like a, you know, fun uh, outdoors organization in some cases. So we have an email newsletter, Find Your Adventure, with over 100,000 subscribers where we highlight these improvements and programs. We also do something uh, called Road Trip for Advent to Adventure. So we're doing mini itineraries that are focused on getting people to one of those places that we do want to promote. So we're promoting these hidden gems that are usually on the easier side for people and then giving them ideas about you know, cities or towns where they can go on their way to grab a bite to eat. Um, we're making improvements to our website and social media with things like Instagram stories and Facebook stories and, and doing a lot more with video as well. Uh, and then in, in general, whether it's in print, on the ground with our maps or digital, we really place a strong emphasis on making sure that our imagery and our messaging is welcoming, it's friendly, and it's inclusive. We feel very strongly that it's important that you know, New Yorkers see themselves reflected in these activities. They see themselves participating in them. Um, so we, we always make sure that we're, we're showcasing people of all ages and abilities and backgrounds in our communications and materials. And, and certainly when we work with I Love New York and ESD on our com shared communications, that's a priority for both of our agencies. And then last, you know, the DEC certainly could not, you know, not only could we not uh, steward and maintain 5 million acres of land without partners, um, but the same is true with promotions and marketing and getting the word out. Um, working and collaborating with our sister agencies, nonprofits is very important. But I do want to especially highlight our, what I think is a very strong partnership with ESD and I Love New York. I think it's even, you know, since I've been at the agency, we are much more coordinated in our messages, um, happy to participate in things like the state fair and your media nights. And then I was just looking on Instagram um, to see some recent posts and just wanted to really acknowledge you know, the great work in, in making sure our messages are consistent when it comes to sustainable recreation. So here's a post on I Love New York site. It's, you know, it's clearly from, a, I'm sure, from a fire tower, but it's not geotagged. Um, it's all about winter hiking preparedness. There's hashtag leave no trace. This is really important. This is the direction that places are taking that are struggling with how to deal with over tourism in popular areas. So I really just want to acknowledge 
that this is this is great and and we really appreciate that coordination of our messages because we we want people to go to these places we want to feature them and highlight them but we also want to make sure that people are, are safe and and also taking care of the resources so that that was that was what i had but any happy to answer any questions that people might have well first of all i wanted to say that out of the material that you passed around here i did want to say that the the accessibility really did jump out at me and the inclusivity of the, the marketing material really is, is fantastic. I mean, everything from the archer that was in, uh, or the hunter that was in a wheelchair mm -hmm. to the, the trails that are accessible to wheelchairs, I thought that was really, really fantastic. And the inclusivity of, of people of all races mm -hmm. um, is something that we've talked about here a lot over the last several years and mm -hmm. we've been working really hard to achieve. And I think it's really great. So I was really, really thrilled to see that. Um, and then I had a question um, in regards to the ski areas, because I know that, for instance, like Bel Air used to be under EDC control. Uh, 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 DC. DC it control, did, and before my time. Or, I right, hear stories. <laughs> now it's um, Orta. Yeah. But um, I guess in 2015, there was a management plan that was created that included the addition of High Mount Ski Resort to oops, climb up ski area mm -hmm. to Bel Air. Do we know if anything is going to be happening with that? I don't off the top of my head, but I can certainly find out for you where that is. I mean, we do work closely with Orta on making, you know, the management because these facilities are in the Forest Preserve and in the Catskills and the Adirondack. Mm -hmm. So there, there is very close coordination between the agencies to make sure that everyone knows what's going on and everyone's following the management plan. So I can find out for you yeah, what this I don't, is. Because the management plan is like the last thing that was actually, I think, done and that's still under um, the, uh, the DEC purview, I guess. Uh, I should know the answer to that. I mean, it's it's a it, it. I don't know that it's under our purview, but yes, there there are these management plans because it is state land in right. the forest preserve, and they even though it's a ski resort and they do have different management classifications, there are still some rules that they must follow. Just right, but I guess on, but, but yeah. that area is not under border control because it's the because they don't have high mount. Okay, I will find out for you Great. what the status is of that high mount. Yep. Any other questions? I just want to echo what Laura said. You know, even in my time here, our collaboration with DC has gotten more and more through the years, and we've we've almost gotten down to, to almost real time now that if there are updates uh, to DEC recreation. Um, we are now working pretty hard to make sure that if there's one particular trail that's being overused or sometimes there's even issues with weather and other things, we're getting that information out particularly through our digital channels. But, you know, even in just as simple things of which photos we put in our travel guide and things, um, you know, that, that there are times you actually need to de-emphasize certain areas over other areas. Um, and so it's, it's been a continued great partnership. Great. So. That's it. Should we ask if any questions from the phone? Sure. It's unmuted. It's oh, okay. Unmuted. Um, on the phone, are there any questions for uh, Laura DeBetta and the DEC? Okay. Well, so do we have any new business at all? Okay. <clears throat> I just wanted to um, give a quick update on. Uh, I'm Chris Gadone. My company is Big Picture Tourism. Um, Wine, Water, and Wonders, I'm here representing. We are, I just wanted to mention, um, we are finalizing our partnership with Delta Airlines this Friday, and we're hosting uh, a webinar tomorrow to bring on new investment and partners. So um, just a, a two-second commercial. So thank you. Appreciate it. Sorry for being late today. And, and Wine, Water, Wonders, as Markley alluded to, was probably now the longest standing, what well, was an itinerary, and it now is more of a, a company, an organization, um, but started as an itinerary of an easy way to sell upstate New York uh, with New York City as a launch pad uh, to our international partners. Because basically what we heard when we went to tour operators overseas is, what can we sell? Give us a product to sell. And for a long time, Water, Wine, Water, and Wonders was that product. It still is a very important and really great and robust and ever-growing 
uh, set of, uh, of products that are available to, uh, internationally and, and otherwise, um, and now it's part of a, a, a growing group of others as well. So continued good luck. All right, any other new business? All right, well, thank you all for your time. Yes, this, oh. this is a, yes? I was going to say, this is Dan Fuller. Just to update, um, we are hosting U.S. Nationals the second weekend in March in freestyle here at Bristol, which will be a pretty large event, both from a spectator uh, standpoint and from participants. Okay, great. Thank you, Dan. All right, anything else? All right, well, thank you all for your time. Our next meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, February 26th in Albany, though this may change. Um, as you know, we try um, to schedule this meeting around the same time as the um, industry is in Albany lobbying on Tourism Action Day, um, and those plans are still evolving. Um, that meeting will be coordinated by Sarah Emmett, as Kelly will be leaving soon on maternity leave. So if you have any questions, please send them to Sarah. All right. So our meeting is adjourned at 12.12. 12. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.